I mean, Chris did send two questions, but it's already been an hour and five minutes, and James has already started inviting other guests onto the show. That's never happened before. Welcome to Thinking Deeply About Primary Education, a podcast that makes time and space to think about pedagogy, teaching and learning, professional development, anything of interest to time poor but enthusiasm rich primary teachers. This week, I'm joined by Rachel Walker. Hello. And James Radburn. Hello. And this is both your first times on the podcast, guys. It's lovely to have you here. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you so much for having us. Looking forward to it. And the focus of the episode is going to be tech, use of technology in education. But first, Rachel. What are you reading for? Hey, what are you reading for? Okay, so I'm reading two things at the moment. Firstly, very relevant, actually. It's a brilliant book. Um, it's more of a publication that's not really a sort of enjoyable read, but just something that's really useful because I'm a computing lead at my school. Um, it's something called The Big Book of Computing Content by the Raspberry Pi Foundation. And it is a fantastic kind of Bible, really, I guess, of all the curriculum for computing um, right from early years, right up to actually year 13. So it covers up all sorts of exciting things, but it breaks down all of the content for um, all of the different strands of computing. But it's got lots of interesting articles in there about um, exciting computing um, developments in technology and um, ways that it's used in industry as well so it gets you thinking more widely as a computing lead rather than just I've got to teach coding so that's pretty cool and I am this year um, the second thing I'm reading is a book all about um, early years because I'm, I've just started being a PPA cover teacher across the whole school and dipping my toes into early years for the first time and um, feeling quite nervous about it. So now that I'm a little bit more in my stride, I've decided to do some reading to go a bit deeper. And that is um, Alistair Bryce Clegg's Best Practice in the Early Years. Um, it's a bright yellow book and it just looked like a good sort of starting point for looking at research into the early years, but I've literally read the first chapter of that and um, yeah, loving it so far. James, what are you reading for? Um, excellent. And those two books, Rachel, are fantastic. I've read both of those. And um, I think it was a very, very similar situation where I was thrown into early years. Um, and that was the first thing I picked up and opened and I really opened my eyes. Um, one of them, uh, one of the books I'm reading at the moment is Thinking Deeply About Primary Mathematics, uh, Kieran, because I came up as a um, maths lead recently. Um, while I had a baby and then while we had Ofsted as well and it worked out in my favour, all of those things somehow. But because I'm driving around schools uh, late at night, um, awake with babies and things, I'm listening to an audio book um, about Radical Candor by Kim Scott. Now, she worked at AdSense for Google, Apple and Dropbox and Twitter and her book's all about leadership but have caring personally but also that challenging directly and she's got some wonderful stories in there about leadership outside of education and lots of lessons in there that really bring into my role as an assistant head and working across our trust as well um so Kieran what are you reading at the moment my recommendation is a blog and it's by Juan Fernandez who is a Spanish secondary school teacher and in his blog which can be found at Investigación Docente He's got a, his first blog in English, which is Beware of No Problem Teaching. And essentially, he explores cold calling and where it can possibly go wrong. And I think Rachel in our Discord, um, different Rachel, um, she mentioned that she'd used it with her teachers and was asking the question, why do so many people think they're cold calling when they're not? Um, and I think that's a really important, important question. So this week, we're going to explore technology and education. I had really hoped to have read Daisy Christodoulou's book about technology and education before this episode, but we haven't really done one. Um, and I think we need to do one there, uh, Teachers versus Tech. Yeah, nice one, James. Because I'm a bit of a tech skeptic, and I know that I work for an education company that utilizes technology. And so I do believe that technology does have a, a place in education, but sometimes I feel like it can be shoehorned into situations where it's not and 
that can have um, sort of negative consequences. But I think before we do anything else, I think we need to establish what we mean when we say technology, because as my eight-year-old will say to me, everything is technology, because then you go through a list of things that aren't computerized, and I say, that's technology, that's technology, and yeah, it gets tired pretty quick. So Rachel, for the purposes of this episode, what do we mean by technology? So I was thinking about this, and I started to write things down, and the obvious Thing for me is obviously kind of laptops and iPads, tablets, um, whatever you have um, for, you know, Google tablets and, and things like that. But then when you really drill down into it, we're not just talking about those things. We've got things like PCs that quite often sit in people's rooms, um, computing robots, things like Spiros or apps and programs that live on those devices. Um, and things like projectors that have been around for a little while, but definitely still live and kicking in a lot of schools. So I think when we start talking about tech in the classroom, I think mainly for me, it's really about how we use devices that children have got on their desks, but can include all those other things that we perhaps use as teachers to instruct and to get children on board with what we're trying to get across to them. Building on that, Rachel, it's, it's those tools, but it's also the systems behind it. I think technology is a bit of a paradox when you start looking at it and it's a moving field that constantly changes. And so it's really the advancement of education, teaching and learning through that use of technology. So it can be things for teaching. So it could be use of Seesaw, Teams, Shobi um, for assignments. It could be used for learning. So what formative assessment um, and communication tools you could use. It could be a simple um, links to administration. So your MIS system, timetabling, how you talk to parents online, um, but it's also the devices and that infrastructure that underpins it. And I think as educators in school, it's our job is to try and connect the dots of what it looks like. And there was a really interesting quote I read the other day that Thomas Edison was quoted in 1913. He said, books would soon be obsolete in public schools. It's, probable, it's possible to teach every branch of human knowledge, but most in picture, our school system will completely change inside 10 years. Well, that's 1913. And technology can have an impact, um, whether it is having a purposeful impact and what that does look like is interesting. And I think COVID has moved us forward in lots of ways. Um, using technology and think about its purpose of it but it's still a paradox and it's really interesting following what almost the DfE think technology is to what it is actually in the ground um, as we're teachers as well. Yeah I think it's quite important that it, thinking about the DfE and what their vision of technology is that technology is so much more than just putting a laptop in front of a student. It, there's so many other things that have to be considered before it can have any sort of an impact in the classroom. And I think in many ways, lots of practitioners are nowhere near well equipped enough to be able to really make the best use of it. It's really quite different from giving somebody a pencil and paper. Um, there's there's just so, so much more that you've got to do with all those systems and behaviour management changes, um, management of your own emotions and how you cope with challenges when things are thrown at you. because as I'm sure every teacher listening will know, when you get given 30 devices, it's probably guaranteed that at least one of them is going to give you some sort of problem, possibly and probably more. <laughs> so it's how you handle all of those as well. So there's, um, there's a lot that goes into it before there's something that actually appears in the classroom. This seems to raise more questions than it answers. Is, the, is there a, an argument with the DFE about what technology is? Do they define it in a different way than everyone else? Honestly, I'll probably have to go and look back at exactly what they report and say um, at it. What I think is, is interesting is the EEF has started to put the use of technology into their reports as well. So they came out um, a while ago um, with a summary of recommendations of how it can be utilised within school. Um, and that comes into consider how it will improve teaching and learning um, about the quality of explanation modelling, the impact of pupil practice, um, and improving assessment. Um, one thing the DfE have done is thought about the infrastructure in the background, um, and they've recently released some guidance behind what they think the standard should be for primary and secondary. And so I know one of the things for primary is that you have a 120 uh, megabyte line, whereas secondary, I think it's a gigabit line. 
that they ask you to have. Now, if you've got a large three form, and we've even got a five form entry primary school, well, that's actually not sufficient. And that would only last for a few years. So with the levelling up programme of what the government wants to do, you'll see that technology and this raising of standards and is interweaved into a lot of things. But I think as Rachel and I are really alluding to, it's all about the learning first um, and actually how does technology support that. Um, and I think that's the really core concept that we need to think and consider and make sure that what we do put in place and with restriction budgets and everything else that comes with that actually is the infrastructure and what we're doing from an operational point of view, supporting education and teaching on the ground as well. And really those things have to come hand in hand. You have to have really strong pedagogy and you have to have really strong infrastructure. When you've got those two things, you have the possibility of some really fantastic things happening in the classroom. But if one of those isn't right, then you're not then you're gonna have problems. Yeah, so that, that's pretty clear. You you know, from both your responses and then from sort of the additional bits, you're like um yeah, it's an extension of the teacher and the systems that allow the, the teacher to be successful in the classroom rather than technology for technology's sake. And I think that feeds quite well into sort of the, the first meaty question. Does it have a place in the classroom and why? I mean, you're already alluding to the fact that it might. When I was at university, um, I had a professor called Steve Wheeler and he came up with a phrase saying, learning first, technology second. And I remember, and I think it's probably the only thing I remember from university, um, the lectures, was he had a picture of a transparent boat. And he said technology should be transparent in the lessons. It should be a way there to improve learning. It should be a way to support what you're doing. And in my role as computing and digital innovation lead across our trust, and I work part of school improvement, I see the use of technology making teacher and learning explicit. So for example, one thing that we all do um, with children is explain and model. Now, traditionally, um, a lot of teachers may have things on a PowerPoint. They show those pictures on there. And I know even back in the day when I had lesson observations at university, there was a box, have you used IT? And it was just literally, I put a PowerPoint up and I would tick that box every time. And no one really knew what that meant but if you think about explaining the modeling there's supporting that direct instruction you can really go from big picture um from google and zooming in onto the context it could be virtuality trying to bring abstract concepts um about the egyptians or the pyramids to life within the classroom and it's building those images and concepts with the children and it should be almost an extension and part of your toolkit within the classroom as well and there's lots of things, and I'm presenting to our heads and directors tomorrow based on these ideas. It, there are lots of things like about allowing you to be responsive and being adaptive in the classroom. We need to be adaptive to our teaching, and we need to think about actually how can we do that. So tools such as I know complete maths and learning by questions allow me as a teacher to choose some questions to work out what do the children know. I can do some check for understanding based on that. And I could be really responsive. If the results are, I've got six children here, I need to work with, I'll bring them forward to me to work in a small group while everyone else can go on to a do now activity and vice versa. And it's how you integrate good technology with your teaching and learning, not only to help with the workload, but to give you those insights that you may have overlooked um, quite easily as well. Yeah, definitely. There's There's so many different things with the teaching itself that technology can enhance then um there's a really helpful model called the SAMA model um which we often talk about in our trust about um what the role of technology is in your classroom and it's at the beginning level we'd expect people to be using the s is for substitution but we would really be aiming to go right up to the r which is where we're looking for it to completely revolutionize the way that you're teaching so you kind of go from substitution through to augmentation which is where it's making it slightly better then you're looking through to modification which is then making sure that you're ch changing your teaching um, for places that it couldn't really go if you were just using your standard teaching in the classroom 
and um is redefinition actually i think is that r isn't it that's how we call it so it's redefining your teaching completely so it might be an example of taking your year fours on a viking adventure to a museum that they never would have been able to go to because perhaps you live on the south coast and you can't get up to york so you get to go to that museum and take a tour and then do voice notes and record your learning in a way that you never would be able to had you not got technology in the classroom but that's not where most people start most people would start simply at substituting it and lots of our schools start with perhaps their reading lessons where they are um having the book on the screen and they are simply using it to read the text and the children can then maybe draw on the screen instead of drawing on a piece of paper but there's so many different elements within that that we'd be taking people on almost like a pedagogical journey to towards getting used to the technology but the aim for everybody is that actually technology can take you so much further than your standard classroom practice could do um, but you have to believe in it to be able to get to that stage and and you have to come overcome those hurdles of things like it might all go wrong the internet might be too slow when you're uploading something um but the possibilities are are, are there for so much more than that when you're when you're using it in the classroom I'm not sure I was as skeptical as I thought I was because I'm not along to most of the stuff you guys are saying. So maybe I just didn't realize, maybe I'm just really averse to the, the bad or the Im less impactful uses. Neil Almond was sending us a video the other day of him floating about to this medieval castle on his computer. And we were talking about how great it would be if there were castles that had been sort of augmented, you know, so that, you know, right now they are stones. You know, I'm thinking places like Hadrian's Wall, not necessarily a castle, but a lot of excavation had to go on to find out what was there. You know, if you could take kids around that kind of place, it'd be fantastic. Because, you know, he was looking at, was it the Martin Bailey um, type castle that they had? Um, and yeah, it, it, it looked fantastic. And you were getting this like first hand experience. Less is more with technology and use a few things really well. So for me as a teacher, uh, as an educator and looking at this from a operational point of view, as well as a delivery point of view, I make sure that our teachers have an iPad and a stylus and they can mirror. Just having those few tools opens a whole world of best practices for teaching and learning um, and being able to have a stand, put children's work underneath it or take a picture and crop actually. Let's focus on this sentence, not the whole book, let's focus on this element of it. Um, and you learn new things every day. I was talking to some teachers yesterday afternoon. I was like, we need quick ways and quick wins. And how do we annotate? Well, if you take your Apple Pencil, if you've got an iPad and scroll up from the bottom left corner, it takes a screenshot. Well, then you've got all the pen tools. I don't need to take a picture, annotate it. And often we're very quick and we've got to be responsive in the classroom. It's very hard to be responsive if you don't have the tools at your disposal. And I think that's where technology can help. So we use learning by questions that gives me some really quick analysis. Um, I can be responsive. I can say, right, let's address this misconception straight away. Now, we're not going to get rid of teachers. I think COVID's proved that. We've done online learning and we're still here. We've still got a job. So the art of teaching is really important, but I think these tools, if used appropriately and properly and really thought about, can really complement and support what we're doing. And what I really like about these tools, about complete milestone by questions, and you know, carousel learning by adding boxes as well, it allows, there's lots of questions already thought out there. There's lots of resources you can already use. They've been peer reviewed, and it allows that more pupil practice it allows in that classroom, let's try and practice, let's get this fluency um, and make sure it goes into, from our working memory, into our long-term memory so we can go deeper with these concepts as well and be able to explain it and justify and explore. I think there's something interesting there that you've given quite a lot of maths examples. I would often say I think maths is actually, I, I'm also a maths lead as well for my school, and I find that maths and technology lend themselves very, very well to each other. I think because there are so many apps out there that, use those algorithms to work out what the children know and what they should know next. Times Tables Rockstars is another great example of how technology can really, really help with something like fluency. I think where it then 
takes perhaps a little bit, bit more thought is where we look at it across the rest of the curriculum. So how might you use it in RE, for example? And we've used it in school to um, record conversations between children and record thoughts about things that perhaps they don't want to share as the whole class, but you as a teacher are able to then get those responses and have a look at the way that they're thinking about things. And so it's quite amazing that you can do that across the whole curriculum. Um, and I'm excited about a time when different resources, I think people tend to focus a lot on maths and English because obviously there are core subjects and like I say, maths lends itself very, very well to technology. But I think there's a lot in our future that's gonna keep on coming to give us more resources for things like English. I'm excited to see people build writing revolution styles, sentence training software where children can put clauses in and work out where the punctuation is supposed to go. I think that's probably the direction that things are going to go over the next few years. And I'm excited to see what that might look like. And we've done lots of that within our school, thinking about how you can scaffold work for pupils. Um, I had a child in year five who wouldn't say boo to goose and we had a class assembly and I wanted every child to have that opportunity to speak and obviously is really important. So for him, we decided that we would green screen, we would record it on an iPad and he would be the news anchor. And he sat in my classroom during the lunchtime with some of his friends. They recorded this on a green screen, loved learning about how to change the backdrop. And I think he spoke most in front of that camera, in front of that group of children, and was so proud that it shared to all of his peers, the whole school, which was 600 pupils, and all the parents, and it gave him a voice. And one of the things I think technology does, it makes that incidental learning visible. We're not here to capture everything. We don't need to capture everything, but it's a way for rehearsal. And if you think about the talk for writing and we use the right stuff by Jane Constein, they have these days called experience days. And we know oracy is really important. Tools like Seesaw Show me allow you to record. So, for example, um, in a lesson I know that's being delivered tomorrow in one of our schools, they've got the different plot points of the story and they are going to record, the children are going to record the ideas underneath it. So they can listen back to that and then apply that in their writing. When you talk about the writing revolution, I love that idea, that book. And we've just replicated some of those within our, within Cecil and just moving things across. I think the danger comes though, and it comes from the Samar model as well, where you replicate exactly what you do on pen and paper onto technology. Because actually I've been in schools where they've put technology in place They've got iPads, they've got a one-to-one -one system, but they haven't thought about what are the strengths of technology, which is moving, highlighting, annotating, and what are the weaknesses? Well, long form, if you've got an iPad, actually writing on it, annotating, is not the easiest and long form text isn't. And it's not always writing should be the end game. I think when you look at history, for example, and you've got debates coming up and you're, you have got a discussion you can plan your ideas on Seesaw, you can have your uh, concepts, you can practice it, you can sort things out, you can, and then use that as your guidance almost to have that classroom debate afterwards. So technology, I think, I think what Rachel and I are seeing is technology can be used at different points through a lesson for different purposes. It doesn't have to replace a whole lesson. And I think that's where good integration and good implementation of technology comes but that takes time and sometimes getting staff on board of here's an iPad, let's move it to our screen. What can we do with it? And showing a castle as simple as that and bringing children on that journey can make a huge difference um, to the teaching and learning. You guys are really convincing. You know, I'm, yeah, I'm happy to accept that it does have a place in the classroom. Although, like I say, as I'm listening, I'm feeling maybe I thought that already. Rachel, was something you said there about, um, books becoming digital because one of the things I've struggled with is the switch from paper to tablet and so I've got lots of ebooks but as you guys would see behind me I've also I prefer the physical copies are the young are younger people making that transition more readily than perhaps some of us are a bit too old now well it's interesting I think 
I think there are different positions on this. I think our children are exposed so to so much digital content now that they're not necessarily reading books on screen, but they are reading on screen a lot. And um, our reading lead is fantastic. Um, and she did a bit of training with us about reading rivers and asking children to track what they were reading across a 24 hour period. And it was really interesting because it was like, they were reading the storification of a game and they were then reading a little bit of a social media feed and then they were reading messages from friends and actually if you looked at it a lot of the content that they were reading was digital on the flip side though there is some research out there i can't remember the exact research it is but i can definitely look it up but it's about how actually information goes into our brains better when we are reading on paper rather than reading off a screen um I can't particularly remember the reasons why that is, but I can definitely surmise that there are things like distractions. You know, when you're on a screen, you get your notifications through. It's also much more tempting to read differently when you're on a screen. I think you read more quickly because you're used to scrolling and getting the general gist of content. Whereas when you're given a piece of paper, it, you have to take it all in and, and I think you approach it differently. And so I definitely think that paper copies of things have, have a place as well as digital content. But I think they they sort of come hand in hand, really. Nice. Yeah, because the market probably will swallow paper books up over the last 10 years if it were on its way out. Um, so, yeah, so I, I can totally see that. So I feel a bit better about myself as well. We started to branch into the next question. And if I could throw this to you, Rachel, what are the features of effective utilization of technology in the classroom? I mean, what would your guiding principles be? So if I were to look, if I were to walk into a classroom and see technology being really used effectively, I would be seeing very, very deliberate choices about when and where those devices were used. So it would be everybody iPads away because at the moment we're focused on the front of the classroom because I'm giving you some input and I'm expecting questioning and I'm expecting you to join in. But perhaps then in the next five minutes, everybody's iPads are out. They're giving an answer to some questions and the teacher's using technology to see all the answers simultaneously so that they can do some really effective assessment for learning. Perhaps then I would see that the teacher makes a choice about which particular things to share with which particular children. Um, on Shobi, there's a really great feature where you can set assignments up to then have uh, content that's only shared with certain children at certain points so you can have maybe three different things saved into a folder but the children don't see any of them till the point that it's appropriate for them to see that in the classroom so I really would be looking for teachers to be very very deliberate about the choices that they were making when technology is used but also really really tightly controlled because you are at our head was saying about how you give the child the world in front of them when you give them a device and that's the most incredible thing but also the most distracting thing in the world so if we don't control it then really we've lost them it's the same as giving them a like play-doh and lego and all sorts of other things to try and play with while you're trying to teach them um, about subtraction so then it's how does the teacher make sure that it's really really focused on the learning and we know that with cognitive load theory, it's really, really important that the children are only thinking about really small amounts in their working memory at any one time when we're trying to get them to focus. And so we can't be overloading them with loads of split screens, apps going everywhere and lots and lots of different things when they're thinking about really tricky content. So those for me would be the, the kind of starting points of some really, really effective practice, but also technology is really engaging and I think I would love to see teachers having fun with it and getting the children standing in front of a green screen and pretending they're in the Great Fire of London like our year two teachers have done and then they've gone on and done first person storytelling about their experiences and um, it should be creative it should be doing things that you can't do when you're just in the classroom and trying to imagine things that perhaps you haven't had any experiences of the cohorts that we teach quite often they're not as well traveled perhaps as we are as adults and they can't imagine going to the beach or they can't imagine the middle of a city but we can use technology to to take them to those places to give them those experiences as well so yeah as, as kind of starting points that's really what I'd be looking for I think building on uh, that idea Rachel of taking them on a journey one thing that we're very lucky at one of our schools is to have an immersive room 
And so we have quite a small room where we can get about eight children in and we can take them to the depths of the bottom of the ocean. And the sound and the four experience is incredible. And before it went in, I was a bit skeptical about how it could be used. And looking at even our Senkos, they've, and YouTube's amazing because it's got 360 um, VR videos that we can put in there. But we've prepared children by they've never been to hospital before and they've got an operation coming up. So we've actually sat in the immersive room and put them there so they're ready for this. Or children who've never been to a theatre performance. And it's not just for everyone where we can get some really st great stimulus for writing or going on visits where we can't actually travel maybe to across country or to the other side of the world to go and see these amazing things. Technology can, to a degree, replicate it, but also it can really support the those SEND pupils and nurture for children as well. Now, my role as digital innovation lead kind of sits between the technical elements, um, and I'm a teacher who knows enough technical uh, of how the infrastructure and how that causes it, as well as the teaching and learning. And I think that's a really interesting bit to sit in between because what Rachel was talking about was all those amazing teaching and learning things that we can do, but that doesn't ha happen if you haven't got a good infrastructure behind you. And so things such as even what your financial plan is, have you got the right AP points in there? What's that look like for the next three years, five years, 10 years down the line? What support have you got from your MSP, which is your managed service provider or technicians? Are things set up safely? Um, I know we both use iPads mainly because you can lock them down so tightly and control them through things like Apple Classroom. Um, we know the security is safe on there. They update their security profiles and um, ISO quite often. But it's things like communication, collaboration, and there's an awful lot of elements to what a good digital strategy can look like. Now, one of the reasons over lockdown, um, we didn't really advocate too many live lessons. We did a lot through Seesaw, we did lots of videos, and then we added bits and pieces because during the first lockdown in particular, we didn't have a situation where all teachers had their own laptop. And when they were in school, we knew our infrastructure and our broadband wasn't fit for purpose. So what was going to happen was they're going to have false starts, there was going to be frustration, and there was going to be resistance. Instead, we did things on Seesaw, we had activities and then we recorded videos and actually limited what we put online. And actually that, trend, that worked extremely well. By the time the second lockdown happened during COVID, we had put a lot of these things in place. We had a clear digital strategy um, and we have now got a, almost a 10-year plan in place with things we're doing. I know we'll last 10 years and be above and beyond what we need now, but we'll still be fit for purpose down the line. And it's those, it's all how all of those things interlink are really important. Budgets in particular um, are constrained. And we're looking at schools of actually, do you need to cut staff? How do we save money? And as a trust, I know we are, as a 15 schools, we really are looking at what we can do. One of the things we've looked at is how we lease devices. So I've recently bought a car. Um, it's an electric car. And I bought it on a lease this time, mainly because I know in three years' time, where battery technology is moving, um, I'm not actually, I'm not going to have that many mileage out of it. So therefore I'd want a new one and keep doing it. It's same with iPads. The danger we often have in schools is we have to put so much money up front, 15, 20,000, we go and get banks of devices. And then in five years time, they're obsolete. And we've got to find another 15, 20,000 to put towards it. Whereas actually leasing, you just pay monthly. You could do parental contributions to it. There's charities, there's ways of recycling. And the danger with old devices is they're not secure. We can't control them in the same way. We can't set up those management tools within it that are so strong in some of these practices um, to implement it as well. And I always go back to, um, I think it's not as five components of organising change, and I call it the dimensions of change. And when you're looking at a strategy, he says you need a vision, you need the skills, 
you need incentives, resources, and action planning. And if you've got all of those elements, you're going to have success. But if you didn't have an action plan, well, actually, people don't know where to start. So you can have lots of false starts. If you didn't have the resources, the technology, you had all the other bits, there could be frustration because things staff want to do, but they can't do it. If you give them everything, uh, the resources, the action plan, here the skills, there's no incentive to do it. Well, why should they do it? Why should staff integrate the use of technology? And there's going to be a lot of resistance. You can give them everything um, under the sky, but teachers don't know what to do. There'd be a lot of anxiety and there can be confusion if you haven't got a clear vision with it. And so there's a lot to unpack. And I think a lot of good um, MSP providers and technicians out there will work with you as educators to understand what that vision looks like within your school, within your setting, and the good ones will work with you. Because the technicians will admit they're not teachers. The teachers will admit they're not te technicians. There's not many people who can sit in the middle who can challenge both sides. And I know I was on a training today and we were talking about logging in for pupils um, and what a frustration that caused. And they wasted 45 minutes of their lesson logging in their year one pupils. And I said, time is money. 45 minutes in a week is a long time. And so you've got to really work and put pressure on and let's find a better solution for that um, practice. Nice. So you've got being deliberate, being controlled, having fun and pushing boundaries. And then immersive, I think, was the best way to summarize your first point, James, and then infrastructure. So those five things, if you consider them, it sounds like you would have a pretty solid approach to the use of technology in the classroom. And I know, Rachel, you said as a starting point, so I imagine you can, you know, there, there'll be much further to go. It's really clear how passionate you guys are about the use of technology. So it must hurt somewhat when you see poor implementation, if, if we consider how much things cost. And the, like you said, time is also money. So the time spent poorly using something, the, the outlay, you know, if we think about certain states in America or maybe counties in America that spent billions of pounds on devices in the past. And what are the red flags we should be watching out for? Say, for instance, I am a school leader and I am hemorrhaging time and money. What, what should I be looking out for? One of the massive red flags for me is, is iPads sitting or tablets just sitting in classrooms. Um, when a big investment like that has gone into infrastructure, if they're not being used, it is just such a waste of money. And that, you know, it's the saying that it hurts. That's what hurts me is when I see all these amazing devices sat there waiting to be used with all these possibilities. And then they're just they're just not used. Um, the other thing that's a massive red flag if I'm going into classrooms and thinking about poor utilization would be if they're just a babysitting device. There is some incredible um, apps out there which will genuinely, like we were talking at, about earlier, they will assess the children's learning and move them on to the next stage. And I think it can be really, really tempting to say, oh, Friday afternoon, I'm tired. You guys can all just go on Prodigy Maths for two hours and have a lovely time. I'm sure they will learn things, but we are not paid to stand in front of them going on things that they could be going on at home. That's really time wasted in, in front of the children. So I would be really concerned if they were just being used as a babysitting device. That's, that being said, there are things we can give the children in school with those devices that perhaps they don't have access to at home. Perhaps it's apps that we've paid for. So something like Book Creator is an amazing app um, that you have to pay for to have on those devices. And our children don't take our devices home, but Book Creator is an incredible bit of software, which um, is essentially like a very, very simple um, word document producer, which can ultimately be exported to be like a PDF or it can be an ebook that's read online with sound effects and things like that. Um, and it's a paid for app and the possibilities with it are amazing. I'm using it everything from early years right through to well year six, but also I've produced um, 
brochures for parents on it about e-safety that have then been uh, they're, they're then live so the parents get a qr code and then i can just add digital um online safety updates whenever they become relevant so it's like a live parent booklet so you can use it for all sorts of different things but it is a pay for app so those kinds of things we can give children those experiences in school when we pay for them but i definitely wouldn't want to want them to be just an opportunity to be babysat as well i think traditionally what we used to have when I started teaching was you'd have digital cameras. Um, and even if I open up drawers in schools, I still find those old digital cameras. And what did staff do with those pictures? Absolutely nothing. Or spend hours going to the photocopier back and forth and printing reams of pictures, sticking in books. And even nowadays, one of my frustrations is technology. They haven't thought about how to capture that learning and utilize it within what they're doing already. So they may do some stuff on the iPad. Um, they may do some green screen. They may do some video editing. They may do something on 3D modeling, but it's just stuck on that iPad and they don't know where that iPad is. And you, when you come and do a pupil voice with those pupils and talk about, okay, show me what you've been doing in computing. Tell me about this. Not only am I frustrated because they can't show me, the children get frustrated and disheartened that they've lost their work. So when you're really looking at utilization and implementation always think about where do you want that work to be what how is that going to look so we use seesaw or showbiz another equivalent and i've seen schools use book creator as well is that going to be part of their digital learning journey in some ways and integrating that within what they're doing already and so one of those things is because we use seesaw from early years to year six we got rid of um like early year learning platforms like ILD or Tapestry or Too Simple. So we have that consistency running through all of our schools. So we can, teachers know how to use it, pupils know how to use it, but also most importantly, parents do. And so what technology can do is break down the barrier of home and school. And so as a parent, you can ask your children, what have you been doing in class? Um, you can ask them, I know pet, some teachers even put like retrieval questions on that you can ask your people and break down that do you know if you ask your child what have you done at school today they're going to say nothing or they're going to forget um or they don't want to tell you but actually seeing what they've done and carrying on that conversation is fascinating my son's just gone to um start a reception and I asked him the question about Diwali today and he was telling me all about Diwali because I know he's done that in school if I asked him what have you done today he would have completely shut off and it's those conversations where technology if we are sharing things and breaking down the barriers of the classroom but it's not just four walls learning happens all the time and we want to instill a lifelong love of learning my frustration is actually when it's just on ipad and it's lost and they don't can't see their work again and as a child imagine if you had work on somewhere you spent hours on you're really proud of and you can't access it or see it again so that that would be my frustration slightly more subtle but not um a slightly more negative thing when technology isn't used so well is not actually considering what the learning is so it's really really key when people are using it for say science or something um there was a, a lesson i did a couple of years ago where i wanted to use science as a, um, a, the, a program called clips an app called clips that you have on the ipad uh, for a science investigation and i wanted the children to take pictures of their science work all the way through and then add an explanation over the top of it afterwards with arrows and explaining what they what they'd learned in science but what was really key for that science investigation and the result of that to use a bit like what James was saying having that kind of outcome it was really really key that the children had some clips understanding beforehand they'd never actually used it so it i had to make sure that i had a separate computing lesson all about how to use clips before we could even start thinking about the science because if I had tried to do science and clips learning all at the same time probably they'd have had a great time using clips but we would not have got anywhere with the science and so it's a little bit more subtle and that's actually where you, when I said as a starting point of good good use of technology this is where I'm aiming for people to get to is understanding which bits of their lessons are about the children understanding the technology and that's the computing curriculum digital literacy and which part are they thinking about maths or are they thinking about science because they have to know that as well and, and there's a really fine line 
and sometimes the, it can get quite blurry between the two and I think it's it's important for teachers have, to have a really good understanding of what the children and it, their experience what they're learning throughout throughout that whole process really. I had the same conversation today I was leading a um, leading primary computing course and we're talking about the IT strand of computing is where you want children to have that core skills and knowledge about these, not just different applications, but different ways of using things. So, for example, year three, we teach them animation. So we teach them what makes a good photograph um, in year two. So it builds onto that idea, talk about um, onion skinning, composition, how it works, linking it to Wallace and Gorman and lots of other bits and pieces. But I know when I've taught them that, that's then a proxy for them to demonstrate and showcase their learning in different ways come in five years, five and six, when you're looking at science or other things. And so a good digital strategy is making sure you have those digital skills all the way through. Um, so my work that I'm working across our schools at the moment is when I'm coaching staff is I want them to write down not only the skills the children are learning about utilizing iPads, but the skills the teachers are utilizing. As simple as how to take a screenshot, how to annotate, how to screen mirror, um, simple little core components like that, because that is then something we can build into almost like a passport of skills. So pupils, right, these are the core digital skills you need to really access technology and make a good use of it and we'll build those up as we go through which then supplement what we're doing in computing and within all lessons but also the same for teachers as well these are the core elements of skills you need so when you come and join our trust this is what we're going to train you in to start off with so you can get started straight away and you don't have that frustration you don't have that lack of skill where you can't access things as well yeah, something I'm really excited about with our digital strategy at the moment is um, we've revised the way that the digital literacy strands are looked at and we're now looking at the purpose of technology. So Michael Tidd's done the purposes for writing. We've turned those into the purposes for technology. So we've got um, technology to entertain, to inform, to persuade, um, and we've used those across our whole school. And so they're now interwoven within the rest of the curriculum. Um, and really excitingly, by year six, they are creating a podcast comparing all the great civilizations of the world because they have looked at the Mayans and they've looked at the Greeks and the Egyptians and the Romans. And so they've got all that knowledge. And then the digital outcome then is they're able to create a podcast. And that's just something I'm working on this year with my teachers but it's something I'm really excited about because it's it's our future and I think when we were talking at the beginning about does it have a place in the classroom we've missed out a whole reason for using technology which is our children need it they are going to be using laptops and tablets when they go to the workplace it doesn't matter where they're working it's powered by technology and so it's really important for our children to have these life skills in technology and it's quite easy to dismiss it because it seems a bit difficult and I think we can be really nervous as teachers to try things that are new or they weren't taught to us coding is a classic example of none of us got that at school so we're all having to learn it at the same time but you wouldn't look at teaching the Vikings and then not learn anything about the Vikings just because you didn't do it at school. You would go away, you'd read about it. But there seems to be this thing with computing that people go, oh, well, I'm sure someone else will teach them that at some point. But we, we can't be like that because we're actually setting our children up to fail. We've also gone down the line of having both laptops and iPads in schools now as well, because they have to know lots of different devices and be able to be completely digitally literate. They have to know how to save a file, use a mouse, have keyboard skills. Um, I don't know any university student that's writing out their assignment by hand and submitting them um, by posting them anymore. You know, you have to upload things, you have to download your course content. There are so many things that children are going to need to know. And the earlier they can start, the better they get. And we can just tell um, we've got some digital leaders in year five and six at our school. And those children that have had the access to laptops at home and tablets from a really, really young age, the content that they produce far far outweighs the content that other children are producing because they just haven't had the exposure and 
I'm so excited about the future of our children who are able to create apps by the time they're 14, 15. There's so many possibilities out there for them. And you sort of look at the big giants of industry now, most of them are software engineers. Most of them are coders and programmers and they're the ones making the big bucks, but they're also the ones that are gonna make a difference in the world. And no matter what you're coming from as your motivation for this, whether it's money or moral purpose i still think you're going to need these skills in the future it comes back to this idea of creators versus consumers i think a lot of us are guilty of just consuming technology people will spend hundreds of pounds on an ipad and we watch things but actually children from as in early years and younger they love to play they love to play within boundaries and technology really allows that and that's what the computing curriculum really is it's all about uh, computational thinking of being able to tinker to play and to be able to create and i think that's where technology allows us to really explore that in new and innovative ways that we've never been able to before if you think about um when we sent man to the moon that computer code was written on paper and our phones are more powerful than the computer that sent man to the moon so it's more about what we do with that technology and how we utilize it effectively. The skills that we're teaching children about, um, we have to be almost device agnostic. Like we need to be able to teach them that those underlying skills and concepts. So there's iPads, laptops, tablets. And yes, we've thrown out a few kind of things this evening about which ones we like, um, which ones work for us. But we're saying this is there's not one answer to everything. And what we've mainly taught about are those underlying skills and core things. And I think often less is more. Let's really utilize those bits and pieces we can do. And we don't know who is going to be the next, what the next, what the future is going to be hold. And whenever we look at future skills, they all look about problem solving. They all look about tinkering. They all look about playing. They all look about actually how can we have a voice in this world. And I think technology allows us to do that. And not only just from a teaching and learning point of view, but from a CPD point of view. And I know for our trust, we've shared curriculum resources across 15 schools. And that's going to possibly impact 5,000 pupils. We've been able to continue CPD. We continue to be able to have podcasts and have people all around the country have conversations like this. And we've really got to think about what we're using for technology, why we're using it, um, because it has some amazing potential, but we've also got to think about the balance of it as well. And none of us are advocating, you just put an iPad in the classroom, that's going to fix everything. Definitely not. And it's all about that purposeful learning. What do we know about the science of learning? How can technology support that? And I'm really interested to see where things go in the future. I'm very sceptical about things when I, I'm shown a new piece of software or shown a new app because you've got to have a purpose behind it and what it does. And I think there's some amazing things out there and the ed tech space itself is worth millions and millions of pounds. But you've also got to go on the flip side of it. There's a lot of digital poverty at home and not everyone has access to devices, to the internet, um, and if they do, it's what are those parents doing it as well? And so whatever technology that we utilize in school, we've also got to make sure that we bring those parents on board. And part of our role is really to make sure that e-safety, but also how we can positively use technology is brought into the home life as well um, to get that rounded picture to make sure we support everyone. There's absolutely no way I can keep up with this because that was absolutely round with gold. Um, and, you know, people always often tell me about, oh, they're going to they go back and they're going to write things down. I'm going to have to write things down whenever I edit this. And then when I listen back to it again, you know, not least because all of the apps and things you're talking about, I've, I've got no idea. I feel like, you know, the Steve Buscemi gif where he's all like, hello, fellow kids. And I'm not that old, but already you guys are talking about stuff that wasn't there when I was <laughs> mainly a primary <laughs> based teacher um, but yeah fantastic I mean will your children will they release their podcast on a platform like Anchor or will it be in house because if, if they do release it you know please do share it because I, I would love to I would love to, something I listen to 
and that's my hope something like anchor would be would be amazing and um, i've got to convince the class teacher that it's going to be possible i think before we get to that point but that is the plan <laughs> I mean, the recording the podcast is a hard bit. The easy, you know, uploading to a, to someone else's server is a, is the you know it's, it's pretty intuitive these days, isn't it? You know, anybody can do it. But I think, yeah, I would love to do an episode on the, on the character arcs of those tech geniuses who became billionaires because they seem to follow a very similar pattern. You know, in all seriousness, I think we've really set up a fantastic sequence of episodes on technology because I'm fully invested now. I'm thinking, okay, what's the next one going to be? What's the next one? So you guys, you know, say goodbye to your Wednesday nights. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm really glad that um, it's gone well because I think I would love to have those conversations with with other educators. Um, and the one thing I've really looked at, because across our trust, we use the walkthroughs for our coaching model. Um, and I'm lucky enough to be in the school improvement and I've kind of walked somehow in school improvement as well as everything else I do. Um but I've taken those walkthroughs and I've looked at, okay, what's the digital kind of spin on this? Because you can give someone, say, say it again better, or you can coach them through that process. But if I give them an iPad and show them something, well, actually, you're explaining a modeling. You're really taking a live model, or you're going big picture, small picture. And they're utilizing those tools in such a purposeful way, and it's that deliberate practice, that if I did it another way, I'm not sure some of those teachers would actually follow those. And it's all built in that pedagogy of it as well. And that was my talk at Research Ed, um, was actually how we can look at good teacher and learning, how we can get that technology interweaved as well. And I think it would be really interesting to see who else we can get on this podcast to explore it as well. And I know Daisy's done a lot of really some amazing work on it. I know Al Kingsley, Mark Anderson, there's some big wigs within the area of it as well. Um, but, and see, I think it's also going to be quite difficult to find someone, because I sit in the middle, I sit between a lot, of, I see lots of factors. So I work with head teachers, I work with directors, I work with teachers, I work with technicians, I work assistant head, I work with, like, I'm a governor at one of the, another school and it's, I see it from lots of different perspectives and I, I find it fascinating talking to all these different areas and I know what I want um, to get to. It would just be interesting to see other schools and where they are in their journey and and it's that rollout, I think, is that implementing is the hardest element of it. We've got a clear strategy, this is what we want, but the implementation is difficult. I also think that there's a history in ed tech of being very... Um, to use the twitter sphere vocabulary very 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 progressive and so i think a lot of more traditional people don't touch it with a barge pole because they think well that's all about collaboration and project-based learning and they're never going to learn anything if i use ed tech because that's the noisy parts of the ed tech industry that are coming out and as i've got deeper into investigations with um, not investigations but involvement with big companies then I've lost my way a little bit with them in, in terms of pedagogy thinking actually I don't really agree with your values I don't agree with what you're purporting here to be good teaching and so a bit like James I sit in in the middle here trying to take all these noisy money-making big companies who are trying to push certain agendas i.e trying to get money from us all but then also holding my professional integrity as a teacher and a leader to be going actually what's what's the benefit for the children that are sat in front of me why do i need to use this i absolutely believe in it but not necessarily for all of these other reasons that keep being shouted at me and i think there is a really important discussion i think the walkthroughs is a great example where we can talk about real life pedagogy and real life great teaching and how technology doesn't only help that but actually it makes it even better but that's a really quite a high level discussion to be having with schools who are not even on that journey yet and I think that's that's our challenge um in, in this space at the moment that's brilliant I think we should use it but not for the reasons that are being shouted at me but yeah that, that is that's a perfect summary of of how many people feel I think yeah so but yeah and that, that, I'd have to see how I can share that as much as possible I mean, Chris did send two questions, but it's already been an hour and five minutes, and James has already started inviting other guests onto the show. That's never happened before. And you, know, you must have been reading Steve Jobs' autobiography <laughs> or something recently. <laughs> um, so what we'll do is we'll save those. Um, 
for next time. They're 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 quite fun. And um, he was giving you if money is no and carbon footprint were no object, what would you want to see in every classroom? But I think that could go on even longer than we've already have. Um, and he wanted to know if um one note could be used alongside an iPad or graphics tablet to replace visualizers. Um, and I think there's a lot of weeds to get into there in that one. So, well, I'll I'll, I'll apologize to Chris. Um, but uh, yeah, like I say. He, he... Say yes. Say yes to that second answer. Yes. Simple answer. Yes, it can. <laughs> I mean, it's a loaded question. He set me up. He wants you to say what he wants you to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, all the set through to say thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much, James. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And everyone at home, until next time, thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.